Omma jnana timarandasya jnananjana shalakaya chaksur militanyena tasmai shri gurave namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Yata Padakamalam Sri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishaka Nitamscha He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Panchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama Hare Hare So we welcome all of you to our presentation this week. I've chosen a topic I thought would speak to you on. The topic is Yoga Ladder. And I prepared a PowerPoint presentation for you to view. I'm, I'm just going to switch on to screen sharing and we'll put... Okay, everyone can see different kinds of yoga. Vaishnavi? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Guru Maharaj. We are able to see okay. the different okay. kinds of yoga. Okay, so I will go through the slides with you here. First of all, give a definition of yoga. Yujati iti yoga. Yuj, from the, sans the Sanskrit word. 
meaning union or to join. So yoga is that which unites, that's what bringing union. The union, union of what? The union of the body, the mind, the soul, and God. Bringing everything into union. So now, what kinds of yoga are there? From the Bhagavad Gita, we should understand the main kinds of yoga. Of course, there are many other different names of yoga, but these are the, the principal ones. Yeah, these are the principal yogas. You have, first of all, yoga of action, karma yoga. Then you have yoga of knowledge, jnana yoga. And then we have dhyana yoga, yoga of meditation, sometimes known as ashtanga yoga. Ashtanga meaning the, the eight steps of yoga. And then we have also bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion. Now all of the, each of these four kinds of yoga are described to us in the Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita is very important scripture for everyone who is concerned with yoga. They need to be familiar with the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. It's presenting such nice knowledge for everyone to understand, first of all, about our own spiritual identity, and then going on to understand more about the spiritual aspects of life and how to control the mind and the senses. So these things are there. We're going to explain a little bit about each of these yogas. Actually, they're, they're connected to each other, as you'll see. It, it's like a progression from one stage to another. So first of all, karma yoga, because yoga is linking, linking with the Supreme. So and by karma yoga, we connect with the Supreme by work, by action, the different things which we do, they can bring us to connect with the Supreme. This is from the Bhagavad Gita. Those of you are maybe gone through Bhagavad Gita. You know in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna speaks about Karma Yoga, the third chapter, and then the fifth chapter, a lot of mention of Karma Yoga. So here's one verse from the Bhagavad Gita, that everyone is forced to act helplessly according to the qualities he has acquired from the modes of material nature. No one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment, right? We, you know yourself, you try to sit, you think, oh, I'm not going to do anything today. I've got the day off, I've got free, but we'll have to do something. You know, we, we get up, we walk around, we lay down, we eat, we talk. We cannot just simply do nothing. So our actions are all influenced by the material nature and it causes us to act in these different ways. So karma yoga is dedicating this action in a particular manner. Oh, let me see. One who performs his duty without attachment Surrendering the results unto the Supreme Lord is unaffected by sinful reaction as the lotus leaf is untouched by water. From the fifth chapter. An example is being given by Krishna, Lord Krishna. He said, just like the lotus leaf is not touched by water. You know, Maybe in Switzerland, I don't, I don't think you have lotuses there in Switzerland, do you? 
not very likely. But in, uh, in here in India and in China, in a more in Asian tropical, kind of a bit more tropical, they have lotus flowers. And the, you see the lotus leaf, it always sits on the water. And it, it's, it, it never becomes uh, saturated with water. The water may sit on the leaf, it will roll off. It won't be absorbed by the leaf. So the, the lotus leaf, sometimes we, we use it as a plate. Just in India, they have that custom sometimes. They will use either banana leaf or a lotus leaf for a plate. To eat off from, to eat from. So, the example was given here by Lord Krishna. He says, just like the leaf is untouched by water, the same way when we do our duty without attachment, giving the result to Krishna, then there's no reaction. We don't get any sinful reaction. So this is karma yoga, this is the principle of karma yoga. That there's, you, we become free of the reactions. Usually everything which we do, all the work which we do in the material world, we're getting karma. And sometimes we do good things, we get good results, and sometimes we do bad things, it brings bad results. We may try to do something to please someone, it may please one person, it doesn't please another person. So somebody else is not happy. Someone's happy with us, someone else is not happy with us. So this is karma. We get reactions. You act in a pious way, you get good results. We act in sinful way, we get suffering. It brings us material difficulties. So when we work, when we do the action, not for ourselves, but we act for Lord Krishna, then there's no reaction. Hmm? We give an example. There's an example. Just like during wartime, the soldier may go and fight for his country. And when he goes and fights for his country, he may fight with people and kill people, but he's not going to be punished because he's, he's working for his country, he's fighting on behalf of his nation. So he may be even rewarded. Although he, he, he may have killed people. So the same way here in Bhagavad Gita, you have Arjuna on the battlefield, he's supposed to fight. So Krishna is telling him that if you can give the result, you do your work for me, there's no sinful reaction. This is karma yoga. Okay, going ahead. See, karma yoga, we don't have the karma yogi, he doesn't have real knowledge. Just a minute. Karma yogi doesn't have knowledge. He doesn't really understand too much what he's doing and things. But he's working. Jnana yoga is where you come to a higher level of awareness. You start to think more about what you're doing. You have knowledge, understanding, who you're working for, why you're doing it. So jnana yoga is uniting with the Supreme through knowledge. How do you get that knowledge? We've mentioned here the source of the knowledge from different scriptures. The Vedas, Bhagavad Gita is actually not directly the Veda, but it's Vedic knowledge. It's a supplement to the Vedas. The original Vedas are four, and the Upanishads, they're also part of the Vedic knowledge. Then there's Vedanta Sutra, Sankhya philosophy, so many different scriptures are there, different philosophies. We can get knowledge. We're studying Bhagavad Gita, basic knowledge, the basic scripture, right? The same knowledge is just expanded into different ways, different shapes, different forms, and these other scriptures. So the, the Jnana Yogi, he will study these scriptures and he will acquire this kind of knowledge. And he will go on to understand more about the nature of the body. You can see here, 
in the chart here, the table. On the left side, the gross elements are shown. Ether, air, fire, water, air. Right? These are the five elements of the material nature. It's also described in Bhagavad Gita. Five elements. This whole material creation is made up of these things. If we analyze everything, every single object of this material world, it's a combination of these different elements, gross elements. Then there are subtle elements. We have shown here. Within ether, there is sound. And you can see the organ, the sense organ, which is in relation to sound, the ears. We use the ears to hear sounds, and sound is there within ether. Next we have air. Air not only has, supports sound, but we can also feel the touch of air. Just like I put this electric fan on, and I can feel the air blowing. So th my skin is able to detect the touch of the air. And within air there is also sound. And then after air then you have fire. And fire has a form. We can see the form of the fire. Or we use vision, and that's with the eyes. You can perceive the form with our eyes. So as well as touch and sound, there is also vision. Then water. Water has a taste. That taste of water is perceived by the tongue. And then finally, earth. Within earth, there is a smell. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am the original fragrance of the earth. So the, the smell or the aroma of the earth, that is perceived with the nose. So you can see the five sense organs on the right, the ears, the skin, the eyes, the tongue and the nose. Five senses which we have in our material body. And each of these senses relate to one of the five objects or the elements of the material nature. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. So this is Jnana Yoga. Understanding this kind of knowledge, analyzing the different elements of the material nature and how they are acting. Jnana Yogi is concerned with all of this kind of knowledge. We, talk, we talked about knowledge acquiring senses, the sense organs. Here you have karmendriyas, working senses. Within the body, there's not only knowledge senses, but there's also working senses. The hands, the legs, the belly, the genital, the anus, they're the working senses within the material body. And then we have also subtle senses, internal, the subtle body, the mind, the intelligence, the false ego, and consciousness. So Jnana Yogi, they're, they're contemplating all these things and they're meditating and studying how these different elements come about and how they appear, how they interact, how, they're, how we are affected by them. This is all Jnana Yoga, studying, you can see, 24 elements. We showed the five gross elements, the earth, water, fire, air, ether, the five subtle elements, the subtle elements being the sense organs, then the knowledge acquiring senses, the skin, the nose, the tongue, the ear and the eyes, the working senses, the arms, the legs, the anus, the genital, and uh, the tongue, and then the four internal senses, mind, intelligence,
false ego consciousness, adding up to 24 elements of the material nature. So what is the conclusion for the Jnana Yogi? They understand the material world to be made up of 24 elements and they also understand that this world is a creation. There's a personality behind it. When we speak about creation, there must be a creator, someone behind it. Just like you look at a mobile phone, somebody must have created it, somebody made it. In the same way, when we look at this world, at this universe, there, are, there is intelligent design behind it. Somebody has created it. That is the Supreme Lord, God. Jnana Yogi also understands that within every human being, every living entity, there's a soul. The soul is different from the body, from matter. That soul is in the heart and within the heart there is also what is called the super soul or the supreme lord. This is the kind of knowledge which the jnana yogi comes to and what does it lead to, we ask? It leads to the next stage. Just like we said, we begin by working. First of all we do karma yoga, we're working. And because we're working in a detached manner, we get some knowledge. We start to understand more about things, what's going on behind the world. And when, then we understand that there's a supreme within everyone. Then the next stage is dhyana yoga, where we meditate on the supreme within the heart. You can see the yogi here. Hmm. Looks like very renounced and austere huh? in the mountains, meditating alone. This is how one should perform Ashtanga Yoga. You don't do this kind of yoga just sitting in your home. You know, people pretend to be yogis, they sit at home, they draw the curtains, they put the lights out, they close their eyes and they meditate. but. You actually really have to get out from the home. You have to go to the mountains, go to a remote place. It should be a holy place. And you should go alone. And you sit on a deer skin. You sit on a deer skin because the deer skin will keep away the snakes. You don't want any creatures coming on you. So that you put a deer skin on the ground, you sit on the deer skin. And you don't have to worry about other creatures coming because the, the smell which comes from the skin of the deer will keep the other animals, even the snakes, away. So like that you sit there and you sit perfectly straight and control the breathing. And in this way, practice, you can see here, Astanga Yoga, the eight limbs. We'll just go through them quickly for you. It begins with yam and niyam. Yam means, yama means controlling the senses. So certain things which we have to do and certain things which we should not do. Just like practicing the Astanga Yoga, you should be a vegetarian. You should not eat meat, fish and eggs. You have to be careful of what kind of foods you take. You shouldn't take any kind of cigarettes or alcohol or these things. There's a lot of rules to be followed in practicing yoga. And that's really the beginning of the Astanga Yoga. If you look in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, you'll see it's described like that. You have to practice celibacy, you have to practice different breathing, uh, oh no, it comes later, you, but you have to practice detachment, you shouldn't be possessive, you shouldn't be uh, materialistic, you have to really be willing to give up many things. So controlling the senses, 
and follow regulated principles like waking up early in the morning, taking bath regularly, full bath regularly, bathing three times a day usually the yogis will bathe. Uh, so these kind of regulated principles and then you, you also do asana, the sitting postures. Twisting the body, bending the body will make the body flexible. Makes the body flexible, that's important because you're going to do meditation. Once you do the asanas, you get the body flexible, then you start to do some control like pranayama means where you press the nose and you control the breathing. You press the nose on one side and you breathe in the other nostril and then you, then you hold it and then change over, press the other side of the nose and breathe the air out the other nostril. Like that, that's pranayama, controlling the breathing. And that's a mechanical process to control the mind. And then you go on to different stages of meditation, prajahara sense control, stopping all thought of enjoyment. Then dharana, becoming very fixed and concentrated in this. The next stage is called dhyana, meditation, where we contemplate the supreme within. And then the final stage, samadhi, fixed mind, where one is completely absorbed in contemplating the form of the super soul, the Lord in the heart. So this is Astanga Yoga. You realize the Lord in the heart, right? So in Bhagavad Gita it's all described. And when Arjuna heard about this, Arjuna said, Oh, he said, that yoga you've described to me, it's, it appears impracticable and unendurable. My, the mind is restless and unsteady. Yeah, very difficult for us today to try to do that kind of yoga which is described here as Tanga Yoga. Very difficult. Can any of us do it? Not for very long. We may try to do it, but not too long. In the past, you can read in the scriptures, yogis would do it, they would go and they would meditate for because in the Satya Yuga, people lived a very long life and they would meditate sometimes thousands of years. And some yogis were so powerful, they would go and they could sit in the bottom of the river or into the bottom of the ocean and they could meditate there just to get away from disturbances. Because you stay here so easy, so many disturbances, people will come and disturb you. You may be sitting, contemplating, somebody comes knocking at the door, your phone rings, something happens, <laughs> you get disturbed. So very difficult to control the mind. Arjuna describes more about the mind. The mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, very strong. And Arjuna says, it's more difficult to control the the, my mind than to control the wind. So controlling the wind, of course, we can understand very difficult. The much even more difficult is to control the mind. So then we go ahead, Bhakti Yoga, connecting with the Supreme through devotional service. Bhakti Yoga means Engaging all the senses in the service of the master of the senses, Rishikesh. One of Krishna's names is Rishikesha. Rishik means the senses and Esha the proprietor. So Krishna is the proprietor of the senses. And our senses belong to him. We're meant to use them in his service. So in Bhakti Yoga, here's how we do it. You can see in the picture, you can see there's a temple and on the te in the temple there's the altar with the form of the deity, form of Radha and Krishna. 
and the man in the front, dressed in the dhoti and the cloth, covered in cloth, white cloth, he's worshipping these forms. He's offering the different articles like incense and flowers and he will prepare foodstuffs and offer them to him, to the deities. So the, in this age, this modern age, Krishna comes in the form of the deity and we install the deity in the temple and we worship Krishna through the deity. We bring our offerings of fruits and flowers. We even recite prayers before the deity. This is all part of the bhakti yoga process. Worshipping in the temple, doing these things like kirtan, singing, and we also dance even for the pleasure of Krishna. If you go to the, the Hare Krishna temple, or maybe you go to some festival somewhere, if they have a, a festival of Krishna consciousness, you can see the devotees chanting and dancing joyfully, worshipping Krishna, worshipping the deities. So this is bhakti yoga. And this is described in the Bhagavad Gita also. This comes in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Krishna is describing, because Krishna has been going through these different yogas, in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna has been describing all, one yoga after another. So now he has come to the conclusion at the end of the sixth chapter, he said that of all the yogas, the one with great faith, who always abides in me, thinks of me within himself, and renders transcendental loving service to me, he is the most intimately united with me in yoga and is the highest of all. That is my opinion. So Krishna is describing here that the bhakti yogi is the highest and he has a, a very intimate relationship with Krishna through his devotion. So this is the teaching of Bhagavad Gita. You can see here the yoga ladder. You can see in the bottom there's karma yoga and then jnana yoga, dhyana yoga and bhakti yoga. Now it's important to understand that one who comes to bhakti yoga then it includes all the elements of the lower yogas. Just like karma yoga is a yoga of action, so he doesn't have much knowledge. But when he becomes a jnana yogi, he's still working, he's still active, but he's also getting some more knowledge. And then when he becomes a dhyana yogi, he's con controlling the mind, he's meditating on Krishna in the heart, He's got knowledge and he's still working. And when he comes to the yoga of devotion, bhakti yoga, so bhakti yoga includes working and knowledge and meditating, remembering Krishna. So bhakti yoga is the culmination of the yoga practice. And the elements of bhakti include all the elements of the other yogas. It's important to understand that actual devotion includes these other things. So how we do bhakti yoga, of course, one of the important ways in which we meditate and control the mind is through the mantra. So we're showing here mantra, man, man means the mind and tra means to deliver, Sanskrit word become a common word now in Western language, probably you can find it in the dictionary today, but the word is actually from the Sanskrit. Actually Sanskrit is the mother language of all the European languages and mantra is a, the ori an original Sanskrit word. So we use the mantra, which mantra? The Maha Mantra, shown here, a reference from a scripture 
from one of the Upanishads, which is Vedic scripture, that the 16 words of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra are especially meant to counteract the sins of the age of Kali. All right, sins. I mean, we know what the sin, meat eating, intoxication, gambling, illicit sex, these things. So because of, the, of these sins, this age becomes very full of troubles and problems. So many difficulties coming on account of our behavior because we don't act in the proper manner. So after going through the Vedic literature, one cannot find a method of religion more sublime for this age than the chanting of Hare Krishna. Very powerful. So we show here two rails of life's journey. Material activity, one rail represents the material activity and the other spiritual activity. May you, maybe you remember, I told you before, that you ha we have to have some balance. We have to have not only material activities, we need also spiritual activities in our life. We need to have some balance there between the two. So then the train can move along very nicely. Material activity means working. We need some money, we have to maintain our life. But material activities, in performing material activities, we must also be very careful. We have to avoid sinful activities because sinful activities entangle us, they bring us reactions, karmic reactions. Just like, you know, if you break the law, then you'll get in trouble. The policeman will come, they'll find you. you, you drive your car the wrong way, you know, they have cameras everywhere, they take pictures and they send you a fine. And so you get punished in the same way in material life. But if we do things wrong, we get reactions for them. We don't, we're not, we cannot be peaceful. The criminal, the, the, you know, the person who's a thief, he's not peaceful. He's always worried he's going to get arrested. People are going to come and uh, put him in prison. So like that, we also, have, we worry when we're engaged in sinful activities. We therefore want to be careful to avoid sinful activities. And we can avoid the spiritual activities by focusing on spiritual activities. Which means, what, what, what are spiritual activities? First of all, chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra daily, right? Not just when we feel like it, but we have to make it a regular activity every day. We have to chant and it should be a fixed number, a fixed amount of time. And then we should also daily read scriptures. We spend so much time reading other things, you must give some time to read scriptures like Bhagavad Gita. Okay, so here's the conclusions now. What we've been speaking about, first of all we say, purpose of yoga is to connect with God. There is God there in the and we have a oh, sorry. Yoga means to connect with God. And there are different kinds of yogas, and of the different kinds of yoga, bhakti is the topmost. God can reciprocate at a perfectional stage. Once we take to spiritual life, you'll see Krishna, God starts to reciprocate, he starts to help us. Where if we think of him more, he will think of us more. Now if we think of God 10 minutes a day, then we can't, you can't expect God's going to think 24 hours about us. If we think of God only 10 minutes a day, then God may think of us 15 minutes a day. But if we think of God more, then God will also think of us more.
then we measure spiritual experience can validate the bhakti yogi hypothesis and hence bhakti yoga is scientific so the point is that this this is a real process which you can experience you can feel it working for you that when you follow the principles of this process you will feel how your life changes and how you feel happier and how you feel much more uh, well situated in life things go much better, much smoother. More conclusions. We are not simply the body. We are spirit souls. Krishna is also there in the heart as the super soul, two souls. There's the individual soul and the super soul. And we have a relationship with Krishna. Our relationship with Krishna can be revived through bhakti yoga. On attaining pure bhakti, one need not be born in this material world, but can go back to the spiritual world. So this is a, you know, the ultimate goal, that when we give up this body, we don't have to take birth again. We can go back to the spiritual world. So that's uh, the ultimate goal of yoga, to get out. No more birth and death. We have the material body. We want to get finished. We want to finish with these material bodies. So that's uh, my presentation to you. I hope you found it a little bit enlightening, something useful there. Any questions? Anyone? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. I am not able to understand the difference between uh, Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. Means, uh, karma, you said Karma Yoga is uh, giving the result to Krishna. Uh, in, uh, yes, I am not able to understand the difference between Bhakti Yoga and Karma Yoga. In, even in Bhakti Yoga, I thought that we are giving the result to Krishna. Yes, I well, I explained to you that in bhakti yoga, bhakti yoga includes karma yoga and jnana yoga and dhyana yoga. So karma yoga is there in bhakti yoga. But there's a difference. You see, in karma yoga, one is simply working and giving the results. There's no real love or devotion. There's no feeling that one may do karma yoga and one may give the results to anyone. They may give the result to Shiva, they may give to Krishna, they may give to Vishnu. They don't really know who to give it to because they haven't got much knowledge. This is karma yoga. They're, they don't really understand who is the supreme because they haven't had that kind of guidance. But they're detached from the work. They're deta detached from the result. So karma yoga is like that. One is working in a detached manner. But bhakti yoga, one is working for Krishna. In bhakti yoga, one surrenders first and then works for Krishna. In karma yoga, one works and then surrenders the result to Krishna. The surrender comes later. But in bhakti yoga, the surrender comes in the beginning. In karma yoga, we're attached to working in a particular way. We work according to our likes, you know, we like to do some kind of work, you do it for Krishna. But in bhakti yoga, We'll do whatever Krishna wants. You see? You don't just think, oh, I want to do this, I don't want to do that. You do whatever Krishna wants you to do. That's bhakti yoga. But in karma yoga, you're attached to working in a particular manner. You have a particular activity you like to do, and you do it and you offer the result to Krishna. Can you understand now a little more the difference between karma yoga and bhakti yoga? Yes. Yes, Guru Maharaj, it is clear now. 
Okay. So, bhakti yoga is essentially based on the activities like hearing and chanting and remembering Krishna. That's really bhakti yoga. There are nine different kinds of bhakti, right? Beginning with hearing and chanting. That's the real root, the real foundation of the bhakti. But then also remembering, offering prayers, worshipping. I showed the man in the temple worshipping Krishna. So that's bhakti yoga. Worshipping the deity, offering prayers, bowing down before Krishna, offering the obeisances, we bow down. And use the mind to think of Krishna by remembering his pastimes and his qualities, his forms. So that is bhakti yoga. But before one can actually do that, one has to somehow, one, we have to purify ourselves a little bit. We have to get rid of the passion and the ignorance. We really have to come up to the mode of goodness to be able to absorb the mind in thinking of Krishna. We have to get rid of some of the dirty things in the heart. So the karma yoga helps us to get rid of that dirty, it makes, makes it easier for us to be able to think of Krishna better. It's difficult for people, if we ask them just to sit and chant, it's a little difficult. For some time they can do it, they can do it a little. Just I remember last week I was asking people how much chant, one round, you know, maybe one round, they do maybe, <laughs> they don't do much chanting. But if we do more work, you see, if they do more service for Krishna, by working for Krishna, then they will develop more taste for chanting. That will come. That's the result of doing service. That you get more taste to hear and to chant. Hare Krishna. Vita Hare Road. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. You have a question? Oh no, it's, uh, I just uh, um, uh, don't. Uh, sorry, I'm very late. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Oh, you just came, eh? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody else has any question on this yoga ladder here? So did anyone learn anything from this presentation today? Maybe you can tell me what you learned. Hare Krishna. Yes, Ramya. Hare Krishna Guruji, thank you so much. Always Vaishnavi used to tell us that Bhakti Yoga is the best to reach Godhead these days. Yes. So we are trying to follow that. Thank you so much. It was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we are so blessed. Actually, they used to say Kali Yuga is the worst, but we are so blessed. We have very easy things to follow and and uh, go back to Godhead. It's very easy, actually. <laughs> Before they had suffered so much, but now we have a very simple solution. Yes, because now is this Kali Yuga. Let's see, we're, we're very fallen. We're very, we don't live a long time compared to people in other ages. You know, and, and people like in the, in the previous ages, they lived much longer than we do today. We have a short life. If we live to be 100 years, we're thinking a long life, but that's, it's actually a very short life. In the previous ages, people lived thousands of years. So, we have a short life, so we need to have a very simple process. We're also 
not very intelligent. We're very lazy when it comes to doing things. We can all appreciate that. You know, we, we find so many ways to have machines do what we're supposed to do. And we don't like to make a great effort to do things. Uh, our minds are also very weak. We're not very good in controlling our mind. Just as Arjuna was saying, when Krishna was describing the Astanga Yoga, Arjuna was saying, oh, I can't do this. My mind is too restless. So Arjuna, he was a great personality. He was the son of, you know, a demigod. And he was born in a royal family. So he was, you know, a very powerful, great personality. But even he said he couldn't control the mind. So what is our position? Certainly we have trouble with our mind and we have difficulty to focus the mind. So we need to have a very powerful process. And understanding this, uh, Lord Krishna came as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to teach everyone to chant the Hare Krishna mantra. Because this is a very powerful way in which we can purify our mind and we can awaken the highest consciousness. It doesn't take a lot of time and it's not, it doesn't require a lot of uh, renunciation. We don't have to sacrifice a lot. We have in our Krishna consciousness movement, we have four principles, right? Do you all know the four principles of Krishna consciousness? Right? Everyone? Yes. No? Right? Tell me, what are they? No meat eating, no illicit sex, no gambling, and uh, hold on, I've got three only right now. Yeah, one more. <laughs> no. no intoxication. Yes. Oh, intoxication. Right, intoxication. <laughs> right, thank you. So these are the, the things which we want to uh, follow. You know, you know, I was uh, preaching in one country, it was a Buddhist country, and uh, one man asked me, he said, How, do you have any rules in your practice? I told him, we have four rules. He was surprised, he said, oh, only four? He said, in Buddhism we have hundreds. <laughs> he said, we have hundreds of rules, but he said they can hardly follow any of them. <laughs> so, you know, what's the good of having a lot of rules if nobody can follow them? So Lord Chaitanya kept the teaching, the process very simple. Four rules, four pillars, four principles which we follow. And it described the symbol of religion is a bull and the bull stands on four legs and each leg represents one of the pillars of the process, cleanliness, mercy, austerity and truthfulness. These are the four principles. Now these four principles are appreciated all over the world in every society in the world whether it's African or American or South American or Chinese or whatever, you know, they all appreciate these principles. Cleanliness, mercy, austerity, truthfulness. So cleanliness is easily destroyed by too much improper association with the other sex. Mercy is destroyed when we take non-vegetarian foodstuffs. Austerity is destroyed by intoxication and pride and truthfulness is destroyed by gambling. So we try to preserve these four principles and the best way to ensure that we are strictly following these principles is by regularly chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. Srila Prabhupada personally said it's not very difficult to follow these four principles. Of course, Srila Prabhupada was born in a devotee family. So from his birth, he had the opportunity to follow these things. But we are from a different culture. We didn't have that same kind of upbringing, most of us. 
So we, or we've developed some bad habits due to bad association, but we can rectify ourselves by chanting the Maha Mantra, by daily chanting of the Maha Mantra, because that Maha Mantra is so powerful. It possesses great spiritual energy which purifies the heart and it takes away the taste for sinful activity. When we chant regularly, we'll no longer have the desire to engage in these kind of sinful activities because we're getting so much pleasure from the chanting of the Maha Mantra. It's giving us so much taste. So this is the principle, this is uh, how we understand Krishna consciousness. We, the more we have a taste for spiritual activity, then the less we are concerned with materialistic life. Swamiji, you mentioned that truthfulness is destroyed by gambling. Yes. And gambling, as I understand, there are many uh, external activities that we do, like go to Las Vegas, and like there are, there are different types of gambling. But on a day-to-day -day life, what would you call as a gamble? Uh, because for me, I don't have any of those practices, but maybe the gambling is a definition that I understand in a very limited term. But are there other things that one needs to be watchful of to preserve their truthfulness? Yes. Gambling, you know, there are many things involved. For In business, there's a lot of gamble, gambling there. Engage, engaging in business activities, the stock market, gambling, you know, finances and so on. There's so much gambling there. And ga we also gamble when we waste our valuable time because the human life, the time which we have in this body is set for us. You know, we have a prescribed length of time. We don't know exactly when it will be up or when it will expire. We have a fixed time in the body. And if we waste this, this time, using it improperly, then it's certainly a gamble because we don't know what's going to happen to us. We don't know where we're going to go. We therefore have to be very careful about using time in the proper way. You know, we spend time, you watch movies and televisions, different things. It's a gamble because the valuable time is being wasted. We don't know what's going to happen, what exactly when we're going to leave the body. You, even crossing the road, it's a gamble. <laughs> you don't know a vehicle is going to come and hit you, run you over. We gamble in different ways. Of course, certain gambles we have to take, but we don't want to unnecessarily engage in many uh, activities, risking the valuable time, the valuable human life. Well, thank you, Guruji. That's very, very powerful. Uh, it's one of the best lessons I've got in my life. Thank you. Yeah, we say, uh, I think Chanakya Pandit said, time is the most valuable thing, that you can buy an inch of gold, but you cannot buy an inch of time. So, and, and time also, they have a saying in China, they say time moves like an arrow. It goes so fast, you don't see it go. So time is like that, you know, every moment it's gone. And one moment gone, it's gone forever. We never get it back again. That time is gone. So we want to be very conscious and careful about how we use our time, to use it for the, the most worthwhile activities, the things which are really important to us. Thank you, Mishra. Let me thank you for your nice question. So, we are explaining here the different yogas. I hope you, you can contemplate this. 
over the next week and uh, we want to understand how much how much it is difficult for us to control the mind and the senses it's really something which we have to practice we have to train ourselves are we the, the servant of the senses or are we the master of the senses so of all the senses the tongue is the most difficult to control and we have to really focus on that and think how to use the tongue in the proper manner tongue is used for two activities speaking and tasting so we want to be very careful about speaking and tasting we want to speak words which are pleasing and beneficial and truthful and we should also want to taste foods which are also nourishing and satisfying and purifying these kind of activities are all part of bhakti yoga in bhakti yoga we learn to use the tongue to chant Hare Krishna mantra and to recite the scriptures and we use the tongue to also taste the food which is offered to Lord Krishna so tomorrow is a very auspicious day tomorrow is uh, Akshaya Tritya which is a uh, traditionally it's a day in which uh, you can begin you know if you're doing some kind of new program or new venture or maybe you make new vows new practices it's a very good day to commence them. one of the things which happen on Akshaya Tritya is the road which goes up to Badrik Ashram and the up through the Himalayas to Kedarnath and Gangrotri, Yamunotri that road opens on Akshaya Tritya so tomorrow that road opens so people can go up there to the Char Dams visit these holy places and tomorrow is also the first day of what's called Chandan Yatra a day in which the, the deities are traditionally covered with sandalwood paste we put sandalwood, we anoint the body of the deity with sandalwood paste because this is tr it's very hot this time of the year in India and to, for the comfort of the deity the devotees like to cover, anoint the body of the deity in sandalwood pulp. So it begins tomorrow, it goes on for several days, Chandan Yatra, two holy days, both tomorrow so you can also con contemplate you can also watch on Mayapur TV if you are watching and you, on your video on your computer log in to Mayapur TV you can see the program there in Mayapur the Kirtan going on and how they deck you can see the deities how they're beautifully decorated Okay, so do we have any questions here? Any more questions or anything you'd like me to explain? Vaishnavi? Guruji, if, if there is. Oh, sorry. Yeah? Yes, Prabhu. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh -huh. Guru suppose if we are working, uh, we are not. Uh, how we can do. Uh, uh, how we can surrender the self to Krishna? Like, uh, is it Karma Yoga or uh, how we can do it? Means, uh, many times we are not in direct devotional service. We are working and uh, many other things. That's how can we relate it to Krishna? Yes, well, the sadhana 
the spiritual practices which we do in the day are like foundation for that day. Like in the morning, before we go to work, ideally you want to try to do some chanting. You want to try to do, offer some prayers. You want to uh, maybe read a little bit from the Bhagavad Gita. These are just like we go to the temple in the morning, people go to the temple in the morning and they worship the deity and then they go to work. There are many places, especially in India, where there are temples, people will come to the temple first and they will see the deities and they will offer respects to the deity and they will also take part in some of the praying and chanting and then they will go to work. So you have to, you, you, people are working, you, but you don't want to work all day and only working. You need to have some time for some spiritual activities in the day. If you're not going to do it in the morning, then you should do it in the evening. People also can take their beads with them when they go to work or they can take a book also with them when they go to work so that when they get a break, when they have lunch, they can chant, they can read the book or when they're going to work, maybe they're traveling in the bus or in the train, at that time they can chant, they can read the book. We have to try to make full use of every moment of our time. It's a challenge. Do we want spiritual activities? We, if we're serious about spiritual practice, then we will make time to do these things. Just like we make time to work, we make time to eat, we make time to sleep, because these things are necessary, these things are important. We have to understand that spiritual activities are also important. We need to allow for them, we need to put them into our daily program. It's very important. Now, what many people are doing these days, they make a group. They get some friends together and they, they read together every day for 20 minutes or 15 minutes or half an hour. Every day they go together on, the, on their mobile phones and they're reading. They take turns to read to each other. This is one way. And other times they may be chanting together. We have, uh, just like we have this session every Saturday, some people, they have this program every day, every morning. They meet together online and they sit to, and chant. They sit and chant together and they can see each other chanting, they can hear each other chanting and in this way they feel their faith increasing and they feel more convinced in the process. And so you can also try like this, if you're not able to do it on your own, right? try to make a group, get a few people together every day, just be together, chant together, read together. So. Other places sometimes they, they're, to get prasadam is a problem, so they have uh, some devotees there, some, somebody's doing it, they're preparing the prasadam and then they arrange to deliver it to the different offices and so on, so that the people can get proper prasadam every day. Like that, we have to organize ourselves. It takes a little effort in the beginning. We say everything is difficult in the beginning. It sounds very difficult in the beginning, but after some time it's not so difficult. It becomes nature. It becomes natural to do it like this. By, it, it's natural 
for devotees staying here in Mayapur, it's natural for everyone to wake up early, you know, about 3.30 in the morning, everyone's getting up, <laughs> you know. Probably in Switzerland, it's unthinkable. But, you know, in, in, a, in a holy place, like Mayapur here where I'm residing, it's natural that everyone wakes up that time in the morning. And because we have our Mongol Arti, 4.30, 4.30 you can hear everyone singing. Even now, although our temple's closed and people are not going to temple, but still they meet everywhere in different areas, they meet together and they have the kirtan, they sing the songs, do the puja. So it, it's training, it takes practice, just like in the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna was telling Arjuna to, con to do the yoga and Arjuna was saying, oh, it's so difficult to control my mind. The wind would be easier to control than the, my mind. But then Krishna goes on to say to Arjuna, he says, Arjuna, he said, I know it's difficult, Arjuna, but it's possible. And then Krishna says, how is it? Two things that are required. One is practice very important. Practice. We say practice makes perfect. You practice, you do it and do it again and again. Gradually you start to do it better. Practice and the second thing is detachment. Because we are very attached to the material life and to the material situation, we don't want to let go of our materialistic life. So. If you don't let go of the material, how can you expect to taste the spiritual? If we want to taste the spiritual, we have to let go a little of this material side of life. Very important for us. Is it clear? Yes, Guru Maharaj. So Prabhu, you had another question, another point? Yeah, we can probably ask that with another question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Prasaji. For me, the question was, um, at any point of time, we may have a conflict between choosing between work, between uh, knowledge, karma, dhyana, bhakti, and different, different needs keep pulling us in different directions. How do we prioritize at any point of time? Well, it's, it's not a problem if, you, you know, sometimes we're working, doing karma yoga, we're working for Krishna, other times we're maybe getting knowledge. These things are all helping towards our bhakti. It's all going to help us to do better bhakti. So it's not a, not a big problem that sometimes, yeah, we have to work, we have to do our karma, duties are there, that's okay. Not, not a problem. Krishna understands. But just, you know, whatever you do, you do it for Krishna. You do it for Krishna. Yeah. You're getting knowledge. Okay, do it, do it for Krishna. I want to have more knowledge to understand Krishna better. Working, working for Krishna. And med remembering, meditating on Krishna. We have to remember so many other things also. No, just like in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is fighting the battle. Krishna didn't tell Arjuna, Oh, Arjuna, you just sit down and remember me, and just chant my name. No, Krishna tells Arjuna, fight. Stand and fight. He wants Arjuna to do his duty, but he also wants him to remember Krishna. You, you re remember me and fight. <laughs> so that's the idea. You have to, we have to work, we have to do different duties. At the same time, we also have to remember Krishna. Srila Prabhupada had an, he gave an inter uh, there was an interesting event took place. Prabhupada was in America and he, he, was, he had to go to the immigration office and talk to the immigration officer about his visa. He was getting a green card so he could stay in America at the time. 
So he was interviewed by a, a lady, who, the immigration officer, and so she was asking him about the Krishna conscious philosophy. And Prabhupada was explaining to her how you have to remember Krishna and at the same time work. And so she said, oh, it must be very difficult. But Prabhupada said to her, he said, no, he said, just like you, he said, you're a woman. He said, but you remember, you, you remember to, you know, to, you dress very nicely and you put on your makeup and so on and your hair's very neat and smart, but at the same time you're working. And so you're, you're a, you're, you may be a married woman with children and you're working, but you remember your duty and at the same time you remember your family. You may be working, but at the same time you remember your family, you don't forget them. And so the same way we're working for Krishna, we have our spiritual family, and at the same time we're working. And Arjuna is the example, he had to fight, go on the battle. But Krishna told him, remember me, hmm? become an instrument in my service, Krishna tells Arjuna. Just be an instrument in my service. So we're like that. We're trying to be an instrument in the service of Krishna. Krishna is the master. We are his servants. We're just trying to do some service. If we can do a little service for Krishna, then that's to our greatest benefit. That, will, that benefit will be with us, life after life. Whatever benefit we get from these material activities, it's finished with the body. But our service to Krishna, that's for our eternal benefit. Whatever progress, whatever advancement we make in this life, we'll take it with us to the next life. But whatever education we've had here in this life, we'll leave it all here. You may be PhD, big scholar here, next life, you're nothing. You have to start again. But whatever devotion we've acquired for Krishna, we'll continue from that point in the next life. So this is the great benefit of doing bhakti yoga. Thank you, Guruji. Thank you. And uh, my brother Prabhu, he joined from Chennai for the first time today in this discussion. Oh, oh really? He's in Chennai just now? Yes, and he's part of this discussion. Today is the first time he joined. Okay. Is he familiar with our movement there in Chennai? Anna, are you there? Are you familiar with them? Yeah, no, not exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, we do have a we do have quite a a, cent, a big center there in Chennai. Okay. But it's okay. it's a little out from the city. It's over near the near the sea, I think, and over in the coastal area there. Okay, 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 okay. Probably like the, I I visit one over a week, like once a month. Yeah. <laughs> Much, yeah. Yeah, I'm also in India. I'm also locked down presently. I'm up in <laughs> Bengal. <laughs> so at, at, at this time, we're taking advantage of the uh, Zoom and other things to meet our devotees and to present Krishna consciousness. Yeah. Uh, Guruji, in fact, uh, like whatever uh, Vijay was asking, the same question I want to ask you also. Uh, probably in a different way. Uh, it's like uh, you told that. Uh, four different types of uh, yoga. So if somebody is following only karma yoga, by, one, by only following karma yoga, can someone reach Krishna? Or they have to elevate to uh, the next level, next level, and then reach Bhakti yoga, and that is when they reach Krishna? Well, Krishna does say in Bhagavad Gita that he can only be understood by devotion. That it's devotion which is the proper means to approach Krishna. But Krishna also says 
as we surrender to him, as we surrender towards him, he rewards us accordingly. So by karma yoga, we can know Krishna in some, in some aspect, but not completely. Okay. Yeah, you know, Krishna, the, the, Krishna is understood in different ways. He's understood as the Brahman, he's understood as the Paramatma, and he's also understood as Bhagavan. So, the Jnanis particularly, they understand Krishna as the Brahman. And the Yogis, they understand Krishna more as the Paramatma. But the devotees by Bhakti Yoga, they understand Krishna as not only as Brahman, not only as Paramatma, but also as Bhagavan. Now, Karma Yoga is it's, it's a very powerful thing, Karma Yoga, actually, because it can bring us very close to Krishna. But from Karma Yoga, then it's not so difficult to actually become a Bhakti Yogi. Karma Yoga, you know, naturally we have some attachment. We want to work particular ways. We have attachments to what we're doing. We don't want to change and so on. So Krishna facilitates it. Okay, you can do that. Yeah. And we, okay. will, we will come to Krishna gradually. But by bhakti, it's quicker and easier. If we can do it, if we can do the bhakti, the thing is, we're not, we're not everyone's ready, not everyone's so able and immediately to take up bhakti. So the karma yoga is like a preparatory step, it's like a preparation for bhakti. You do... Hmm? A karma yogi can get into the spiritual world. He, uh, well, he can get into the spiritual world, but the question is, what will he? Where will he stay, or what will he do there? See, uh, just like the jnani, he can get into the spiritual world, but he doesn't get into the actual spiritual planet. He just enters into the impersonal brahmajyoti the Brahman, the effulgence, the impersonal effulgence. And he will stay there for some time and then he'll come back into the material world. So it's like that for the jnani, that his position is not very secure because he's not properly focused. He's only, his intelligence has not yet been fully purified. So, karma yoga, we have to also try to cultivate that little bit more knowledge to bring us to the higher consciousness, the higher platform. If we remain on the karma yoga platform, then what is our destination? Well, some karma yogis, you see, not all karma yogis are devotees. As I said, the karma yogi often is not sure who is the supreme. And he may offer the result to Ganesh, he may offer to Shiva, he may offer to Durga, he may think it's all one, they're all the same. So that person, they're not going to go into the actual spiritual planet, but they will enter into the effulgence, into the impersonal effulgence. So when they come back, uh, like are they going to come back as an enlightened soul? If they come back, then they come back into the material world in the higher planets. They're given some place in the higher planets initially. They're coming back from the spiritual world, they'll fall back into the higher planets like in Swargaloka or somewhere like that, and they will enjoy in the higher planets. It means they, they're given, a, they have a lot of piety, but not a lot of purity. 
because they've left the spiritual world. They've come out of the spiritual. Why did they come out from the spiritual world? Because their intelligence was not yet fully purified. They had not yet fully taken shelter of Lord Krishna and accepted Krishna as the master or the supreme. So they come back into the material world, come back in the higher planets as a deva, and Swarga Loka and enjoy there for a long time and then may come down to the earth planet. And when they come down to the earth planet, this earth planet, this is Karma Kshetra. This is where we earn our karma. We're all earning our kar karma right now. You know, the work we do, the activities we do, it's earning our karma. Where is it going to take us? Is it going to take us to, where do you, do you want to go to Swarga Loka? You want to go and enjoy in the higher planets? You can go there for some time, but you know, you enjoy there for some time, then you come back. Or you get even Sayuja Mukti. You get Mukti, but Sayuja Mukti, merging into the Brahman. So that is not actual liberation. And they stay there in the Brahman for some time, no activity, and then after some time, because no activity, no variety, no relationship, so it becomes boring. And the living entity's nature is to have activity, to have relationships. But if we're denied these things, then we come back into the material world to look for them. But if we're fortunate, if we get the association of a devotee, from the association of a devotee, they can bring us into the right consciousness and take us to the right place where we can stay there forever in the association of the Supreme Lord, Vishnu or Krishna. Right? So, this is the Vaishnava teaching that we want to go into the, into the Goloka Vrindavan or the Vaikuntha and live there with the Lord, and engage in activities, in relationship with Him, there. So karma, karma Yoga, the Karma Yogi, he, you know, he's, giving, he's detached from the work. He just needs to get the right association. And then with the devotee touch, that can bring him very quickly to the perfectional stage. Yeah. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Do we have time for another question? Yes, Prabhu. Go ahead. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, um, I, was, my, I was wondering why do we see uh, somebody who is innocent, uh, maybe a newborn child or a very young person, or somebody who is, has not committed much sin, also suffering from very... Uh, bad consequences or bad, uh, very badly. Why do we see a newborn child suffering, for example? Well, we have to understand that we're all born with karma from our past lives. So each of us is taking birth. Our birth, the body which we have today, it's our karma from our past, from our previous activities. The body we take is decided by our own desire and our past activities. So we are suffering or enjoying the results of our past deeds. We say someone's born into opulence, enjoying so much comfort and luxury. Why? Some piety must have been there before. They did something to deserve it. And the same way, it's, 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 I know it's difficult and painful to understand, but we have to understand each and every living entity has some particular karma from our past, and that's why we get the particular body we've got. Some children are born in diff very difficult conditions. It's not by chance. It's 
we're working off the results of some past activities. Karma is not eternal, however. We should understand karma can be changed. And the way in which we can change karma is by devotional activities. By doing very sincere and intense devotional activities, then we can destroy the past karma. I was showing you that when I talked about karma yoga, remember the leaf untouched by water. So the same way one who's engaging in activities is not touched by reactions. So karma yoga can destroy also karma, not only bhakti yoga, karma yoga can also destroy karma. But, bhakti, but the benefit of bhakti is that the bhakti will destroy the karma so that the sinful desire will not come again. If we simply do the karma yoga, then the sinful desires can still come again in the mind. But with bhakti yoga, the sinful desires will not come again. So that's the power of bhakti yoga, that it can remove all the karma. The karma is in different phases, right? There's karma which is there manifest in the body, that's uh, prarabdha karma. There's parabdha karma and aparabdha karma, the karma which is not visible. So we see karma sometimes, you can see it visibly in the body, somebody's enjoying or somebody's suffering. So that can also be removed by bhakti yoga, by doing very intense devotion through the chanting of the holy name. Can you uh, give us examples of karma yoga? You said karma yoga can also destroy sinful activities, uh, sinful reactions, but uh, yeah, it doesn't purify the heart. Yes. Uh, so karma yoga, well, it, it's, just, it's working, you know, you do your work, whatever work, you, like, like Arjuna, Krishna told him, you know, that you should fight. You're, you're a Kshatriya, your duty is to fight. But Krishna said, karmani evadikaraste mapale shu kadachana. You do your duty, the result, the fruit of your activity is not for you. So that is karma yoga. Uh, you may go to some Mayavadi ashram, a yoga ashram in the Himalayas, and they may say to you, would you like to do some karma yoga today? And they will ask you, maybe sweep the floor, or help uh, cut the vegetables, or wash the pots, do some kind of uh, general seva around the ashram. That is karma yoga. Uh, you're working without any expectation, you're, nobody's going to pay you or anything. You're just doing it as a service, detached manner. So that is karma yoga. You come to the temple, says, they may say, Mataji, would you like to help us clean the temple today? And so that's karma yoga, cleaning the temple, doing these things. I remember when I first came to the temple, I, uh, the, the devotee told me, he said, we're cleaning the temple today, would you like to help? He said, and then he said to me, he said, you know, if you clean the temple, it's, it's cleaning your heart as well. So I was very impressed. I thought this is a very good opportunity for me to clean my heart by helping to clean the temple. The karma yoga, like that, working without result. Understand? Yes. We try to engage people in, to do work for Krishna. They may not have a lot of bhakti in the beginning, but, you know, people like to do activities, they like to work. And we may be having a festival, you say, come, can you come and help uh, cook? Can you come and help you know, cut the vegetables? Or the um, ceremony, it's also karma yoga. 
Okay. So thank you all very much. Very nice to meet with you again. I hope our talks had some value for you. And we'll look forward to meeting you again next week. Okay. Any, any final points? No? Vaishnavi? Thank you. Have a good week. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guruji. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhupada. Jai Prabhupada. Jai.